Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Education USA Thursday Live. In today's session, we are going to talk about graduate studies in the US. And we have with us at the American Center in Chennai, Ms. Catherine Bexek, Assistant Director, International Recruitment from Rochester Institute of Technology. So before we go ahead and have uh, Kate on stage with us, we would just give a brief introduction to who we are and what we do for international students who are participating in this session today. And we welcome all our online viewers who are joining us today uh, in the session. So please do stand by and uh, listen to Kate and her valuable inputs on graduate applications to US universities. And as we all know that this is a very busy time for many of the graduate applicants as the exams are on the way. But still, we recommend this session is live streamed and recorded. We would uh, uh, welcome all of you to visit these videos whenever you find time later this evening. <coughs> so just to give you a brief introduction to Education USA. Education USA is a uh, Department of State funded program. And it runs uh, with 400 plus centers in 170 countries. In India, there are seven centers. And uh, five centers operate under U.S. India Educational Foundation, a binational organization. There are two independent centers in Ahmedabad and uh, Bangalore as well. So U.S. India Educational Foundation is a binational entity which was uh, initiated in the year 1950. And apart from administering education, USA, USIF also administers the prestigious Fulbright and Fulbright Nehru fellowships. For more information on these fellowships and scholarships, please do visit www.usief.org.in. So, over to uh, Kate on graduate study in the United States. Okay. Thank you, Kate. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon to talk a little bit about graduate study in the U.S. Uh, as Shanti said, my Name is Katie Bizak. I'm the Associate Director for International Enrollment at Rochester Institute of Technology. And I think that right now in early, mid-November, it's a really great time to begin thinking about your application for next fall. So even though it's a busy time of year, hopefully some of this information will be helpful to you and answer some of the questions that you have about, first of all, identifying the right fit program in the United States for you, and then also creating a strong application for your master's or PhD program. So today I wanted to cover a little bit of information about the landscape of higher education in the U.S. and where to begin when you're thinking about choosing a graduate program. There's a lot of different options out there all around the world and I think it can be overwhelming to decide how to find the best fit for you, how to find the best university, and the best program that's going to help you meet your career goals. I'm also going to review application requirements in the U.S and what's generally expected of a graduate application, and what the admissions committee and the faculty members are going to be looking for when they're evaluating your profile for admission. I'll also give you a couple tips to improve your overall application, and then we will end the session today by answering any questions that you have that I didn't address, or maybe that you thought of while I was giving the presentation. So to get started, I want to talk about the US higher education and system in general. There are over 4,000 degree granting institutions in the United States. So if you're beginning to look for a program, uh, it can be extremely hard to filter that. <laughs> uh, but there's a couple key points that you might consider when you're beginning to make your decision. So first, I want to say that there is a university and a program in the United States for everybody, regardless of what your academic interest is, and uh, also considering what your priorities are in a program. So this is an opportunity for you to really think about the U.S. education system and evaluate what your ideal setting, um, what your priorities are in a program, and then identify that in the U.S. Because I guarantee you there is a unique university or college out there that will fit your, meet, fit your needs exactly, and you may not have even considered them before. So I think when you're beginning to look at a program, identify maybe two or three priorities right up front. If you're looking for a master's program or a PhD, obviously your number one priority is going to be the academic program that you're pursuing and the research that you want to do. So that can be a good place to begin. You can look online, search for graduate programs in computer science or graduate programs in management and see what universities offer those programs. You can then start to filter the options based upon a number of di different criteria. 
And I've listed a couple of them up here for you to think about. You may want to, for example, study in a big city. So if you're looking for an urban environment where you're in the heart of a large city like New York City or Los Angeles, um, that could be a great fit for you. Um, some students prefer studying in a quieter area that can be a little bit safer and more affordable. Um, those are some things to think about. I also encourage you to think about the size of the university. So whether the university is a large state school with 30,000 students or a small liberal arts college that maybe has 2,000 or 3,000 students. The campus life and the environment on campus will be really different depending on which type of institution you choose. And there's no good or bad, it's really just what your personal preference is. And that's something that you have control over at this point. So think about where you want to study and what you want your, your life to look like while you're at the university. Uh, you can also look at student life. So is an active student body important to you? Are you looking to pursue some different interests like sports or um, different clubs outside of the classroom that can help you narrow down your choice for graduate study and also think about the university's global focus whether they offer study abroad opportunities maybe you're interested in an exchange program and if you are then that would be a good opportunity to look for a university that offers different global campuses or different uh, different exchange programs you can also look at faculty and student ratios so how big your class size is um, ask about the availability of faculty and how accessible they are. Um, you can also ask about job opportunities. So any university or college that you're looking at in the United States should be very transparent about telling you where their graduates have gone on to work. So if you are looking at a specific program and you want to know where the graduates have been placed or what kind of jobs they're working, that information should be readily available to you and can help you make a decision or choose a good school that's going to, again, help you meet your career goals. Ultimately, you're coming for a master's and a PhD, I'm assuming, <laughs> uh, so that you can go out into the working industry and hopefully the degree that you're getting will set you up and prepare you for success. So you want to make sure that that information is available at the university. And if you know that you want to do an internship or a co-op placement, um, or if you know that research is really important to you during your master's program, look for universities that offer those opportunities very clearly for their students and for international students specifically. I also want to mention that there are a bunch of different programs out there. There are ME, MBA, MS programs, there's MFA. So identifying the right program can be uh, something to think about too. Masters of Business Administration is a very popular degree in the US for students who are thinking about business programs. Masters of Fine Arts programs are wonderful for film and animation and visual communication design. And then at a university like RIT, where I work, we have ME and MS options. And so you may see that and know that the difference between an ME and an MS or a Master of Engineering versus a Master of Science degree is that the MS tends to be more research intensive and typically requires a thesis. Whereas an ME, the Master of Engineering, it requires uh, usually a project and it's for students who want to be professional engineers. So if you're less interested in research and you're more focused on internships and co-ops, then the ME program could be a really good fit for you. So just some general definitions to kind of help you prepare. So as you're identifying your programs and making a short list of the universities that you want to apply to, you should also be thinking about the different requirements that you're going to have to submit in order to complete your application for graduate study. Generally, universities in the US are gonna be looking at your grades and test scores to make decisions, but there are a lot of other supporting documents that can influence the admissions committee's uh, decision as well. So, Keep in mind that you're going to have to submit transcripts of your undergraduate work and really any work that you've done. So if you did an undergraduate degree and you've also completed a master's but you're applying to a PhD, we would want to see any academic work that you've done up to the date of application. We also are looking for some kind of personal statement or statement of purpose that would explain to us why you're looking at our university and why the program is a good fit for you. We want to see a resume, letters of recommendation, and standardized test scores may be required. Keep in mind that every university and every program has their own way of doing things. And although these are the general requirements, those requirements may vary depending on the program that you're applying to. So do your research early on, look at the university website, and know what is required for each individual program. That way you're not caught off guard at the end if you're submitting your application and you didn't realize that you needed a specific portfolio or maybe a, a specific statement of purpose. Um, 
doing your research in advance and making a list of the required documents will be really helpful to you to help prepare. Other requirements that might be required depending on your program choice are uh, specific writing samples. Usually a PhD wants to see a professional or academic writing sample. Um, some programs may require work experience. And again, programs in fine art, they will also require a portfolio. So I wanted to talk a little bit about standardized testing because we get a lot of questions about this. Standardized tests help the admissions committee look at your potential to succeed in the program. And they kind of grasp your overall knowledge and capacity to succeed. So they are an important part of the admissions process, but they are not the end all be all of the admissions requirements. So it is important to do your preparation, know what universities are going to require, a GRE, a GMAT, or an LSAT. Um, but they are only one piece of the application that will ultimately be looked at. So the GRE or graduate record examination is the general standardized test for admission to a graduate program. And most programs I say would probably require a GRE. The GMAT is the standardized test that would be used for students interested in applying to an MBA or to a management program in the US. And if you're applying to law school, LSAT is another standardized test that's specific to law. Uh, there are preparation preparation that you can do to sit for these exams. And I definitely recommend at least knowing the structure of the test so that when you are preparing for it, you know what's coming and what's expected of you. So you can kind of pace yourself throughout the exam. It is expensive to take the test and you don't want to take the test too many times. So if you're prepared the first time, your chances of being successful and scoring highly will be improved. Um, if you have to take it again, that's fine. Uh, universities generally will not fault you for taking the GRE or GMAT multiple times and will ultimately look at the, the highest score. So if you take the test first or you take it a second time and a third time, whichever score has the highest result is the one that we'll consider for the admissions process. The ETS and the British Council websites are great resources that can help you identify testing centers. They can provide help preparing for the exam and just give you some general information about sending your scores to the university. The easiest way to send your scores to the US is electronically, and you can usually get the university's code so that once you've taken the exam, the scores will electronically submit and be linked to your application. US universities are also going to require an English language exam that's generally in the form of the TOEFL or IELTS, but you can also submit the results of a PTE exam. And every university will have a minimum score that's required for full admission to the program. If you fall below that score and you still want to study in the US, there may be options at different campuses for English language training or um, courses that you can take at an English language center uh, and be offered conditional admission. But those vary by university. Uh, and generally, the higher you score on the TOEFL or IELTS, the more likely you are to be admitted to your program. Okay. All programs will require at least two letters of recommendation. And the letters of recommendation are something that students ask me about a lot in terms of who can write a letter of recommendation, who should be writing a letter of recommendation. I will say again, and this is kind of the theme of this presentation, <laughs> is that the requirements do vary by program, so keep an eye on the specific university that you're applying to. Generally, most universities are not going to mind where the reference comes from, so whether it's an academic or a professional uh, reference. But what will be more closely paid attention to is the quality of the overall recommendation. So I recommend asking the person in your life, whether it's an employer or a professor, um, ask the person who knows you best and who can really write to your motivation for the program, the passion you have for the, the discipline, and write a personal letter because that's gonna make more of an impact on the admissions committee than if you ask your principal or the vice president of your university who doesn't know you well and writes a really generic letter of recommendation. So don't focus so much on getting somebody who has a really strong title. Instead, try to find a, a refer, reference or recommender who can write a personal letter that will sway the admissions committee. We do prefer, in general, that those letters come directly from the recommender. And a lot of universities will offer an electronic submission system where your reference can submit their letter of recommendation for you directly to the university. That just helps us ensure that the letter is valid and coming from that source. And um, that, again, it generally is the preferred way to submit the letter of recommendation. As far as academic transcripts, 
Uh, confirm with your college or university as you're going through the application process what exactly is required. Uh, at my university, we generally accept scanned copies of your official transcripts, so we don't require paper copies. But there are some universities that may. So ask your university or admissions official what is considered an official transcript. Also ask them if an evaluation is required. There are some universities in the US that would require a formal evaluation, like a WES evaluation or an evaluation from another organization that would confirm your requirements and your program meets the, the equivalent of a bachelor's degree in the US. There are also different requirements in terms of mark sheets and transcripts and degree certificates. So it's helpful to keep that in mind and check on those requirements before you apply to the program. And then finally, ask when and how to send your documents. If you're uploading electronic documents for the admissions review process, that's great. But generally, you will be required to submit hard copies of official transcripts and degree certificates before you enroll in the program. And different universities may have different requirements for that. So ask whether they have to be sent early or if they can be delivered once you arrive on campus. And that way, you'll be in the know about those requirements. Moving on to the statement of purpose. Uh, I think that this is a really important part of the application. This is a place where you actually have the ability to showcase yourself in a really great light. Um, I think the statement of purpose can help you stand out from other applicants. We want to hear your personal voice. And this gives you the chance to talk specifically about your background, why you're unique, and why you, exceptionally, are qualified for our master's or PhD program. And the admissions committee will review your statement of purpose. Um, and know that the faculty who you'll be working with eventually also read your statement of purpose. And some things that can help you stand out from the crowd um, are doing your research in advance. So I recommend looking at the university website and personalizing your statement of purpose to the school that you're applying to. So you might mention a lab that you want to work in at the university. Maybe there's a specific concentration in the degree that you're applying for that you really want to focus on. Um, or maybe there is a lab or a faculty member who, whose research you're really interested in. And so if you mention that, it shows that you've done your work and that you're really committed to the specific university. And faculty love to see that and they love to know that you are interested in this program for a reason. You're not just applying to a lot of universities and looking for something general. Check and see if your university or the program has specific prompts for the letter or for the statement of purpose. Um, in my school, we ask for just a general personal statement that's two pages long generally. And it's a statement of career goals. It is a, an opportunity for you to talk about your background, any work experience you have. And you can also use it to explain any bumps in your transcripts or um, in your, your background. So if you had a bad semester, or if there's something that you want to explain, the statement of purpose allows you to do that. But there are some universities that will have specific uh, questions that they're asking that they want you to answer in the statement of purpose. And so you would need to make sure that you're addressing that specific question in order to be admissible for the program. So that's definitely something to look into. And then I say take time to write a strong statement. Don't rush. And make sure you're adding your statement of purpose for each university that you're applying to. Sometimes we see students who, in the effort to apply really quickly, upload the wrong personal statement that's for another university. And we understand that that can happen. But Nothing can rub a faculty member the wrong way, like seeing another university's name in the statement of purpose for, uh, for their program. So take time. Definitely make sure you're looking at that. Uh, another recommendation I have is to use your own words. Uh, we see a lot of students who submit long quotes or uh, long passages that have inspired them. And that's really nice. We do like to see that. Uh, it's great that that quote was meaningful to you. But you really only have two pages to talk about yourself. So use those two pages instead to use your own words and talk about the program and talk about your background. That's really what we want to see in the statement of purpose. And you'll see some universities call their statement of purpose an SOP. Some, some universities may call it a personal statement. I say just look at the website and make sure you understand exactly what's being asked of you. Um, in general, the statement of purpose will be more of an opportunity for you to say what your purpose is for the program. So what are you hoping to accomplish? Where do you see yourself after you complete the program, after graduating? Do you want to go on for a PhD? Do you want to work professionally? How can our program help you get to your career goals, regardless of what they are? Whereas a personal statement can be a little bit more generic. But definitely take time to write a strong statement of purpose, because this, again, I think is just an opportunity to shine to the admissions committee. And outside of the test scores and your GPA, it's something that you have control over and, uh, again, can make you stand out a little bit. 
So other factors that the admissions committee will consider when we're looking at your application are work experience and internships. Some programs may require work experience, uh, like an MBA program. There are some MBA programs that want to see one or two years of work experience. You would want to know that in advance. Uh, but for programs that don't require work experience, uh, we will take any jobs that you've had into consideration as long as they are applicable to the program that you're applying to. So if you've worked in uh, an artificial intelligence position and you're applying to a computer science program, that can strengthen your overall profile, even if that work experience isn't required. Also, completing internships at an undergraduate level can show that you're really motivated, show that you're ambitious, and that you're really putting yourself out there in the field and trying to accomplish a lot. So we look at that, we look at that as well. For PhD programs especially, we're going to be looking at your previous research experience. And although you can apply to a PhD program with little to no research, uh, generally the, the admissions committee is going to want to see some kind of demonstrated uh, success in the research field, whether it's through a paper, through some presentations, um, before they admit you to a PhD program. And for master's students as well, we will look at any papers that you've written. So definitely include that information in your resume so that we can get an idea of your overall profile and what you have accomplished throughout your four years of undergraduate study. We'll look at papers and publications. Again, that helps us gauge your overall uh, motivation during your undergraduate studies. If you've traveled and presented and done great work, um, that really can, can show, again, just how motivated you are for the program. We'll also look at extracurricular activities, although that's probably a little bit less so, um, and we would still want to see extracurricular activities that are related to your field somehow or show um, some kind of leadership skill. So, for example, if you have uh, been captain of your football team, that's great. Um, it's nice to know that you're well-rounded and that's something that master's programs want to see. Um, we'd probably be looking at that as more of a leadership example, um, and it would be less weighted in the overall admissions decision. Um, but if you're doing something like you're um, in your university's Baja Racing Club, and you've been working on different uh, research projects and putting together um, the racing vehicles and competing in those competitions, that's something that's really important and that is re related to a mechanical engineering program or to a manufacturing degree that we would actually weigh a little bit heavier. Um, again, some of the clubs and things like that, you don't need to show us anything that's not related because we wouldn't really look at it to make a decision as much. So those are the admissions requirements that are generally required for all of our graduate students. And we mostly accept our applications online. So you can submit those materials um, quickly and easily and complete your application through any university's application portal. I get asked a lot about how universities make their decisions, and this varies by program, varies by discipline, but in general, uh, in the U.S., we are practicing holistic admissions. So that means that there really isn't a strict GRE cutoff, um, there isn't a strict GPA cutoff, and when I say that, I mean generally. Some programs that are very competitive may tell you right up front that the minimum GRE for admission to their program is X, Y, or Z. <laughs> and so you will find that out during the research process. But for universities who say they're looking at your application holistically and that there aren't major cutoffs, that means that we really don't have a cutoff because we want to look at your overall package. We want to see your test scores and GPA. Those are important. Um, they do indicate potential to succeed in an academic program. But we also want to look at your letters of recommendation, work experience, research, and just get an idea of who you are as a person and how you'll fit into the university. Because that's really important. Uh, we want you to be a good fit for the university. We want the university to be a good fit for you. So like I said at the beginning of the, the presentation, um, there's over 4,000 universities and colleges in the United States. And out of all those 4,000 universities, there's going to be one that is a perfect fit for you in terms of research and career opportunities and all of that. So um, that's what the admissions committee is looking for. That also means that if you have a lower GRE score, don't be discouraged from applying to most universities. Um, keep in mind that your GPA and TOEFL or IELTS score, and even the extracurricular activities and the letters of recommendation that you submitted, they can help balance out that lower GRE score. So I think in that way, applying to the US, you can be optimistic and not feel discouraged by being low in a certain area. Um, university isn't going to automatically disqualify you if you have a slightly lower GPA or you had a blip on your radar and something happened and maybe you just woke up late or 
got it into traffic <laughs> and had a lower GRE score or something like that. So uh, we, want, we want you to be successful and um, we generally are very supportive throughout the process in helping you apply and get you there. Financial aid and scholarships in the US, um, it can be intimidating to, uh, to think about this and look at different options in schools. Every university will be a little bit different, but generally most schools will offer some kind of tuition scholarship. Those are based upon merit. And again, they'd be based upon a holistic review of your application. So if funding is really important to you, that's a great question to ask during the admissions process. Speak with an admissions counselor, speak with uh, a recruiter who's coming to your, your city or to your country and ask them what scholarships are available and how you would apply for them. Um, at my university, we automatically consider students for scholarships, and I think generally that's the case for a lot of master's programs, but there are some universities that may require you to apply separately, or they might have specialized awards that you would need to uh, submit additional documentation for. So definitely do your research. Um, there's, there is financial aid and scholarships out there, but you have to do a little bit of work on your own. So a merit scholarship would be awarded as a percentage of your tuition. Usually it's a, a percentage or a dollar amount that would be applied to your tuition bill every year. And generally, as long as you're maintaining a, a solid GPA, and in the US we would consider that generally a, a 3.0 GPA or about a B average, then your scholarship will renew for your second year of graduate school too. Uh, PhD programs are typically fully funded. So if you're admitted to a PhD program, Generally, the university will provide a tuition scholarship as well as a stipend to help cover your cost of expenses. And that's because you're doing such focused research or teaching with the faculty member at the university that they're paying you to perform those functions. Other funding options in the US include on-campus jobs and international students can work up to 20 hours a week during the semester and up to 40 hours a week during the winter and summer breaks. So there is some earning potential there, and that can definitely be great pocket money to use for additional expenses, entertainment, and it will also get you involved in the campus community. So if you're working on campus in the gym or in the library or in an office, you'll meet other people, um, you'll be a little bit more engaged while you're earning additional, additional income. There are also teaching, research, and graduate assistantships available in the US, and you can ask the program that you're applying to and your faculty specifically how to apply for those. Um, some, some universities will consider you during the application process and they might be able to award you an assistantship at the time of admission, but in, I think it's more likely that the university and the faculty who are, you are working with would want to meet you in person. So when you arrive on campus for your program, you can interview for an assistantship and talk to the faculty more about what your teaching background has been, what your research interests are, and then be offered an assistantship position. And those would usually give you some kind of stipend as well, while maybe covering a portion of your tuition. Once you're admitted to a graduate program in the US, then you need to apply for a student visa, and the university supports you in this as well. So when you're admitted and you decide to go to a university, you would need to submit uh, financial documents showing that you have the liquid funds available to cover the first year of expenses for your graduate program. And the university that you're admitted to will tell you exactly what that amount is. Usually it is the cost of tuition for one year, the cost of health insurance and books and supplies, um, any miscellaneous costs, and that will be the estimated overall cost of attendance for one year. And then the university will deduct any scholarship or assistantship that you've been awarded. So that's deducted from the overall I-20 amount. And once you submit your uh, financial documentation to the university, we will issue you an I-20 and mail that to you. And then you can use that I-20 to apply for your student visa. So I wanna give a quick overview of uh, my university, RIT, really quickly. Um, hopefully the information that I just provided gave you an overall idea of how to begin preparing and selecting a uh, graduate program in the US. And if you have any questions, I'm always happy to talk you through any of those uh, concerns that you might have, whether you're applying to Rochester or you're applying to any other university in the US. Um, and I know that the Education USA Center here is also a great source of information. So um, you have a lot of support should you need it. Um, but to give you an idea of where I'm coming from, uh, my university is Rochester Institute of Technology. We are one of the, the largest private universities in the United States. We have about 19,000 students on campus. We were founded in 1829. And 
we are very well known for our IT programs, of course, being an international or being an institute of technology. Um, I'll move over just so you can see some of our rankings here. We're ranked 104 out of over 4,000 universities in the U.S. And we are ranked highly in computer information sciences, as well as in MIS, film and animation and design. We're located in Rochester, New York. It's the third largest city in New York State. And we have about 750,000 people in Rochester. So it is a, a nice sized city. It's not as large as a New York City or Boston, but there's a lot of culture there. There's a lot to do, and it's generally affordable and a very safe place to study. We have nine colleges. The largest colleges that we offer are the Golisano College of Computing and Information Sciences and the Kate Gleason College of Engineering. But we also have liberal arts, management, and a great college of art and design. So we're very interdisciplinary. We encourage students to work together outside of their disciplines and take electives in other departments. We're also very experiential. The program is very hands-on, and we give students the opportunity to work and apply the knowledge that they're learning in the classroom outside of their, uh, outside of their classrooms uh, through internships and co-ops, research, and study abroad opportunities. What RIT has that a lot of other universities don't, um, which is unique to the university, uh, there's only a couple schools in the US that offer a co-op, and we have one of the oldest and largest cooperative education programs in the United States. And through that program, we've had over 3,800 students complete international uh, co-ops over the past three years. So our students are out in the field, they're working in their discipline, and they're getting really great work experience. The thing about the co-op that makes it different from an internship is that it is full-time work, it is paid a full-time salary, and when you're working on a co-op, you're not paying the university tuition. So you really are focused on building your industry experience, building your network, and getting really great industry experience. Uh, because of that, we have over a 97% placement rate after graduation. We also have 2,600 international students on campus, and half of them are from India. So India is our number one country represented on campus outside of uh, the United States. Our application requirements are similar to the ones that I have mentioned before. And we review applications on a rolling basis. So we are accepting applications now for next spring and next fall. And as soon as students submit an application and it's complete, we generally have a decision within four to six weeks. Oops. Can I go back to that last slide? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so uh, our overall RIT is very career focused. We're specialized and innovative. And uh, I think I have one more slide. This is my contact information. Um, again, Katie, I'm more than happy to help answer any questions that you have about RIT or about university applications in general. Uh, so please feel free to email me at the email address listed on this slide. And uh, I want to thank you again for your attention this afternoon. It's truly a pleasure to be here in Chennai. And I look forward to connecting with many of you at some point in the future. So thank you. I think we have some questions from the online. Network. Oh, great. So we'll take some questions. So there are some few general questions. Uh, could you just throw some light on uh, uh, the co-op programs that you're talking about? So how it impacts the student profile? How is it basically related to the uh, uh, program or the coursework that they are doing? Mm. Uh, how basically the institutions manage that sort of a co-op for graduate students? Uh, sure. So um, some questions about the co-op, and that's, those are really good questions. So the cooperative education placement and internships in the US are considered a form of curricular practical training, or CPT. So when you're working in CPT, you are authorized to work on your student visa outside of the campus, and the department will work with you to make sure that that work is related to your master's program. So it has to be in your field, um, and it has to be professionally related to your program. So 
In the U.S., you need to be a full-time student for at least nine months, generally about a year, before you can apply for a CPT. So you'll come to the U.S., you usually study for the fall and the spring semester, and then you can begin looking for cooperative education or internship placements for either the summer between your first and second year or the first semester of your second year of the master's programs. So that is, uh, that is how RIT works. I think that's how a lot of the universities in the U.S. that offer co-op, those that do, would handle it as well. And once you're you, once you're eligible for co-op and you've identified a, an offer from a company, then you work with the International Student Services Office in your university to get that authorization to go off campus and work. Uh, a lot of universities offer support in helping you find co-ops and internships. RIT, for example, has two career fairs every year. They each bring about 250 companies to campus they, and they meet with our students, they interview you, and a lot of our students will find positions that way. Um, you can also find co-ops on your own by looking online, using any job portal that your university may offer. Um, but there are a lot of ways to connect in the U.S. with, with, um, with companies. And I say that that is a really good thing to think about as you're looking at different universities in the United States. Evaluate the university that you're thinking about applying to and ask whether they have a career services office, what types of services they provide, what kind of career fairs are on campus that will make it easier for you to find a co-op if you want to do one. Thank you. And the next question is about um, uh, the GRE, which you already explained. Mm -hmm. But in spite of it, a lot of students have this uh, apprehension as to what if my GRE score, suppose there is a specified limit, like you need some 116 quants, mm. but the student has something like 152, but mm -hmm. know that there is a great profile, a lot of, re a lot of research work or project. So what would you really advise them? <laughs> Well, if you are applying to RIT, I would advise you that uh, you can still apply to the program, especially if your GPA and your TOEFL and IELTS are strong. Don't be that discouraged by that slightly lower GRE score. But there are some programs and universities out there that will tell you and be very transparent and say that their minimum quant score is a 160. And in that case, you may, you would probably want to take the GRE again. That could be a strict cutoff for them. So it's okay to ask the university that question when you're going through the application process and ask if 160 is a strict cutoff, and it may be. For universities that say, no, this is not a strict cutoff, we are holistic, then if you feel confident in your GPA and your work experience and letters of recommendation, by all means, go ahead and apply. You're not forced to retake that GRE again. Um, to improve your score just to gain admission because we'll look at everything and we'll balance out your entire profile to make a decision. Okay. Do you have a question? Do you have a question? In case of SOPs which you're talking about, mm -hmm. some universities ask us to limit like to a single page or something, like limit our words, the word limit to 500 words or 700 mm -hmm. words. But say if you have like around 800 words, it makes like sense like one and a half pages. Do you recommend it? Or it's, uh, do you recommend to you know reduce it to one page? But the content as well gets a little bit diminished, right? Right. That's a good question. So the question, in case you didn't hear, was if a university says that they're requiring a one-page statement of purpose, can you write for a page and a half or two pages? Would that be read? Um, if the university clearly lists that their requirement is one page, I would stick to that one-page length because number one, that shows that you can follow their rules. Um, and number two, if you submit a page and a half, they may not read that second page. They're probably asking for one page for a reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they probably are reading lots of applications, and so one page is just their limit. Um, so I would, I would say stick to that in general. Um, that way, you're making sure that even though you're editing yourself a little bit, you're pulling out the priorities for you, the, the points that you really want to address to make sure the admissions committee is reading that. Yeah. First of all, I just have one more question. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure pretty what it is like, whether you need to show a writing of what you have published or work with your research. But say it is not yet published or it is in the progress of going for review, do you recommend me to you know, uh, give a gist of what I have done or uh, I work with my professor or what do I do? Uh, so the question was, if a university asks for scholarly papers during the application process, can you submit unpublished work? Correct? Yes. Um, ye I would say generally yes. So if a university is asking for scholarly papers, you could probably submit something that you've done for a class project, even if it's unpublished. We would just, we're, I think we're looking for in that is just a more formal style of writing. 
uh, to get your, your writing skills, your English language skills, um, whereas the statement of purpose is more informal, an introduction to you. Um, so if the program is, is writing intensive, then the, the requirements may include a scholarly paper, and it doesn't necessarily have to be published. Um, when we would look at published papers and research would be really for a PhD application, uh, maybe for a master's program that requires a thesis where we would want to know what you've done for research already. Okay. Um, I would like you to throw some light on how do they basically evaluate a complete application. So we have several components, mm -hmm. SOP, your LOR, and of course your academic transcripts and other things. Mm -hmm. uh, so how basically an admission committee would look at it? So who all would look at it and mm. what is the process if you can just give us some input? Sure. On so for a master's program, for graduate programs in the US, the decision makers are the faculty members. So you may meet an admissions counselor and staff like myself, and we can give you some feedback on what the, the faculty is looking for. But ultimately, once you submit that application, the application is going to go to a faculty review committee, um, usually a graduate program director and some other faculty who will be teaching the students in the department. And they make that decision because they're going to be working really closely with you. They are going to be advising you on your thesis or advising you on your dissertation, and they're going to be working with you on research in the department. So they want to evaluate your background and make those decisions. I think for admission, uh, the most important factor is your academics. So the GPA that you have from your courses, especially the courses that you've taken in your core area. So if you're applying to a, an electrical engineering class or a program and you have failed at your previous engineering classes or you've done really poorly, that's, that can be a problem. But those are the classes that the faculty is going to be looking at the most closely. Um, so they're going to be looking at your GPA, they're going to look at GRE and TOEFL, and I think those do carry the most weight. But we still do a holistic review, and we're still going to evaluate everything that you submit, and, uh, and then I think there's no perfect formula for it. Uh, there's no way to say, you know, your GPA gets this weight, and uh, letters of recommendation get this weight. But strong letters of recommendation, a strong statement of purpose, like I mentioned in this presentation, can really help set you apart and justify your case for admission to the program if there's something in your GPA or test scores that is a little bit troubling to the admissions committee. So spend some time on those supporting documents because I guarantee they are looked at by the admissions committee and those faculty members because they, that's how they're gonna get to know you without meeting you before you come to the program. So. <laughs> Thank you yeah. very much. You're so there's one more question on SOP again. Okay. Uh, so uh, I understand that word limits are, uh, are meant for a reason, but apart from the word limits, sometimes the style of writing. Mm -hmm. uh, some students, uh, you know, prefer writing in a let's say a bullet point style, mm -hmm. and for them the continuous uh, sentences or making a connect with what they did in the previous paragraph, they might find it a bit difficult to go with. Mm -hmm. But great students with a lot of uh, you know practical projects and other things so is there any sort of a standard the university is basically set when they uh, review the SOPs I mean is the content so important or do uh, the even the format and the language styles are important I would say in that case for a statement of purpose the content is more important mm. but the university especially if you're working in a research-based program where you're going to have to write a thesis or a dissertation the university is going to be using a statement of purpose as a test of your writing skills as well so it, it is important to have it flow have some kind of structure we want to see grammar it's less important than the content we want to get across again like what your research has been why are you interested in the program why are you a good fit that's more important to us, but if you have put no effort into trying to proofread or uh, write a strong, a strong statement, then I don't think that would reflect favorably. So what I recommend is utilizing a resource like Education USA, talking with your, your counselor maybe at the university or a friend, have somebody who can help you. If you're not confident in your writing skills, have somebody help you, right? I think the support and the advisors, uh, they would be really willing to take a look at that and help guide you. Um, and I also just kind of say, don't stress too much about it. If you're applying to a master's program or an engineering program where you're not going to be doing a lot of creative writing, I mean, really what we're looking for are your technical skills and your research and kind of work experience. We're not going to be judging your grammar as much, but do what you can, put your best foot forward and get the support that you need to really be able to shine the brightest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. 
The next question is on LORs. Okay. Um, so we often notice uh, many universities are now, uh, you know, capturing only the, or asking for the uh, professor's email address, mm -hmm. and then uh, later on they send a, a request emails to the professors to mm -hmm. submit a LOR. Yeah. Uh, so there are two questions related to this. One is, uh, should the LORs reach the university by the application deadline? Mm. Or is it like when uh, the student click the submit button, the email goes to the uh, uh, professor. So that's the first part. The second part is like uh, many times the professors are not very uh, comfortable, you know, answering uh, questions that come from the universities. Rather, they prefer uploading a, a detailed letter about the student. Mm -hmm. So, could you give your comments on this? How this basically works with respect to your university or in general as well? Sure. I'll speak first about how we handle it at RIT and that is that you are welcome to submit your application before your letters of recommendation are complete. So if you know who you want your references to be, you can list the title and the name and an email address for that contact in your application form. Once you submit the application form for final review, the references will get an emailed link to a reference form that they can complete and submit electronically very easily and that will link right to your application. So we encourage students to do that if possible because it's fast, it is efficient, and we know that the, the letter of recommendation is coming from that faculty person. Um, I, I think that most universities, I don't wanna speak for everybody, and this is kind of another one of those points where I would say, look at the university you're applying to, check out their individual requirements. Um, but most universities, and RIT included, will accept paper, paper letters, um, will accept email letters from the professor. So if your professor has a letterhead, he's written a long letter and he doesn't wanna fill out the form that we have, he can email it to our office and just mention your name. Maybe if he has your application ID number, he could include that in the email, and then we'll upload that to your application separately. So that's completely fine too. <laughs> um, really, we want to do whatever is easiest for you and your faculty. Um, and generally, that is the electronic submission. But if that doesn't work for you, then we can help get your letters linked to your application. Does that answer? Yeah, one more question on rolling admissions. Mm -hmm. So the rolling admissions, uh, uh, we understand, you know, like, if, if you are uh, there is no deadline but however if you are delaying your process of applying you may not be able to get into that particular intake maybe mm -hmm. the admissions are pushed to that mm -hmm. so uh, generally in the case of rolling admissions uh, we also hear something like a priority uh, application deadline so how different is the rolling and the priority because we understand priority also considers you for a scholarship and other mm -hmm. things so is there a variation between them or how uh, how a student should decipher this sure there is a difference um so for rit most of our programs admit on a rolling basis there are some deadlines that have priority deadlines though so if a university and the program that you're applying to has a priority deadline what that means is that you definitely want to strive to get your application complete by that priority deadline and the admissions committee is not going to begin reviewing any applications until that deadline. So you have up until that deadline to get your application in, and then that entire pool of applications will be evaluated together for the first round of admissions. Most universities will then consider applications for the seats available on a rolling basis. But applying earlier gives you a better chance of being admitted and also gives you priority consideration for scholarships. So that's definitely an important factor. For our rolling programs, we truly are rolling until the program is full. And so some of our competitive programs in a couple of the engineering programs, computer science, data science, those programs will fill up. So you want to apply as early as possible. And generally, there's no negative part about applying early. Um, you can apply in November, December, get a decision earlier, and then you're still not required to confirm your intent to enroll until May. So it gives you time to compare offers, to look at different universities, to do your research and make a decision. But at the, the, the benefit of that is that you already have an admissions decision in hand with a potential scholarship award. So I think if you can, do your best to get your application early. That also gives you extra time in case you have trouble getting a letter from your, recommend, your recommender. Maybe they're really busy and they deserve behind schedule and they haven't had time to, to get that. Um, it just gives you get plenty of time to get all of your application documents together and submit that to the university. And then you have time on the other side to apply for a student visa. So I, I definitely, if you can, recommend applying early for any program. Thank you so much. I think, uh, any more right, questions? <laughs>
Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you again for having me. It was a pleasure yeah. to be here. And please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any other questions. Yeah, sure. So. Thank you, Katie. That was, a, I would say, a wonderful and a lot of information. I'm sure everybody has benefited by that as well. So we have come to the fag end of the session today. And uh, I'm sorry, we will be, uh, okay. So if you would like to get in touch with Education USA uh, Chennai and our contact information is out there. Um, apart from that, we also have a app now, mobile app, and I recommend all the students to download Education USA India mobile app. So that gives you all the information on application process to US universities, which also includes shortlisting, um, the putting up a strong application package, and you will definitely benefit by downloading it. And that also connects you with, uh, to the nearest Education USA center. So do reach out if you have any queries about uh, studying in the US to your nearest Education USA center. And here is a snapshot of our upcoming events and uh, we will be celebrating the International Education Week starting from uh, November 18th till uh, 23rd or 24th. And during uh, that week, we have a couple of sessions uh, that will be uh, one at the American Center and the other one at an outside location. So we have a virtual uh, information session on November 21st from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. On the topic is interdisciplinary approach to higher education in the United States. So we will be having a, a Fulbright Nehru scholar joining us on that day and talk about his, uh, uh, his personal experience on having an interdisciplinary education in the US. The second session that's on November 23rd Saturday will be happening at the Indo-American Chamber of Commerce and that's a US U University alumni fair. Close to 15 US University alumni will be participating in that session. So please do come over and connect with them and have all your questions or uh, if you are interested in knowing about their particular university, do talk to them and get all the information because we are almost in the midst of our application process and this is the right time to have all your queries answered by the alumni on that day. So thank you everyone for joining us today on this Education USA Thursday Live and do connect with us and do keep sending your queries either on the US uh, Consulate Facebook page or on the WhatsApp number and also on the Education USA India Facebook page. Thank you.